Shalom, my name is Rabbi Johnny Solomon, and I'm delighted to be speaking with Rabbi Mark Fishman, who is a rabbi at Congregation Bet Tikva in Montreal, Canada. So hello, Rabbi Fishman. And because your accent is quite familiar to me, quite similar to mine, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your journey and specifically, what, can you give us a whistle-stop tour of the chapters in your life that has led you to be a rabbi in Canada? Thank you. First of all, thank you so much, Reb Johnny, for allowing me to be here with you. It's a big honor for me. As somebody who has been following you on social media over the last couple of years, uh, your Torah and content has been personally meaningful to me. And I'll begin with a disclaimer. It has been used on more than one occasion in my own community as well. So thank you for what you do the output that you create, and of course, for inviting me to be here with you today. You're yes, right. you are correct. Um, we have similar accents. I'm originally from London, England, hailing all the way from famous Gants Hill, Ilford. Um, my journey, a whistle-stop tour of my journey, is stop. that I um, went to uh, Ilford Jewish Primary School, Very shout true. out to IJPS, then on to JFS, and I was deeply influenced during high school, what I now call high school, secondary school, um, by my Zionist youth movement. I was a member of FZY. Mm -hmm. And in many ways that, that changed my life. I went and began my journey with FZY almost by happenstance, simply by getting involved as a 16 year old on tour, which was a, a common uh, four week program after uh, high school. And it was that that sowed the seeds of my love of Israel, my love of community, a love of hadracha, and, and giving back to others. And with a natural proclivity, I guess, a force of personality, it was something that was very suited for, for who I am and, and, and the natural gifts I was given. That led on to um, deepening my commitment through my youth movement, deepening a, a sense of creating a chapter actually in Gantz Hill. There was no FZY prior to uh, my friends and I, not so knowing really what we founder. were doing, but creating a chapter. Okay. And every Sunday we would have a bunch of 14 uh, year olds that we started teaching Zionism to. It, it was a different world back then that, that 14 year old kids would suddenly come every single Sunday to learn about Zionism and, and, and play and have fun and be engaged socially in experiential education. Um, after, um, after or before university, I then took a gap year program with FZY on the Mahon Madrachim Michutz Laaretz, a Zionist youth leadership program for one year in Israel. And it was there that actually I started keeping Shabbat. I came from a traditional, what I would call United Synagogue background, which sent me to Jewish schools, yet was traditionally observant. During that year, I started accepting keeping Shabbat upon myself. And that snowballed after I returned back to England with greater observance and greater learning. I attended Manchester University studying philosophy and I really fell in with many of the B'nai Kiva guys who at that time, this is the late 90s, early 2000s, who were at Manchester. I began Chevrotot, I began learning. I began learning a lot in English and it was really secondary sources of what Judaism was about. Primary texts at that point in my life were written by Jonathan Sachs. Right. And I attended lectures that he would give as well as reading his books. And by the time that I finished my undergraduate studies in philosophy, I felt that I had achieved an undergraduate study and an introduction to Judaism. However, I still felt very much an outsider from the perspective of not having studied texts in inside, in the primary language of those texts. Mm -hmm. While I was knowledgeable from secondary sources in English books, I felt very much uh, that I had a lot to catch up on from the Chumash, Rashi, and Talmud. Mm -hmm. It was then through the help of Rafi Zaram, who at the time was advising me that I attended Chappelle's, a yeshiva in Jerusalem for postgraduate students mm -hmm. 
who were not 18 years of age, but rather 23, 24, all having in common, never having opened the Talmud and studied it inside. And it was there that I went, studied, and went for one year. <laughs> I was going for one year, then going to come back to England, didn't really know what I was going to do. And upon the conclusion of my first year, I realized things are only starting. My momentum is only building up. How can I leave now? I need to stay a second year. And if that was true at the end of my first year, I realized at the end of my second year, oh boy, only now do I realize that I'm only now starting to learn. How could I leave now? Only now is the momentum building up. That was true at the end of my second year. And I said, how could I leave now? Only now am I starting to learn. I, before I was, I didn't even realize I didn't know anything. I need to stay a third year. And I stayed a third year. And I was able to be blessed during that third year to really make great strides in my learning. I met and married my wife in Jerusalem during that third year. Wow. She was studying for her PhD at the time. We came back to Canada where she was studying for her PhD in the university in clinical psychology. At that point, I had the greatest blessing that what I wanted to do did not materialize. And at the time, I wanted to begin a smicha program after just three years of study. Right. But that fell through and collapsed. And at the time, it was a disaster and devastating for me. And it was a double lesson. First of all, it led on to the greatest blessing and secondly, it led me to learn, not just know, but actually experience that when plans don't go according to what you believe is the correct path, sometimes it can be the greatest bracha in your life. And because I did not enter into a smicha program at that point, I found myself in a satellite Lakewood Kollel in Montreal, learning Gomorrah all day for the next three years. Wow. Wow. I got through all of Nadarim and all of Ketubot with all of the Run and Tosfa. It took me three years. I stood out like a sore thumb. <laughs> I, I really was not part of that world. But and what that world that as well. What that world does really well is learn Gomorrah. <laughs> yeah. And for three years, I learned all of Nadarim and all of Ketubot with all of the Tosfa and the Run. And I have to tell you, it was the greatest probably the greatest time in my life we had nothing we had no money we had we were in a one bedroom studio apartment this was before kids we had nothing as i remember those days the memory that i have is that we would squeeze the toothpaste tube as tightly as we could to eke out a little more toothpaste because we couldn't afford to buy a new tube of toothpaste and in that poverty i learned torah and three years later Sarah had finished her PhD. We return now to Israel. And then I embarked upon a smicha program. And those three years in Montreal under my belt did me the world of good. I, I was a different person qualitatively through my learning as a result. And at the end of those three years of smicha, we found ourselves in Montreal. So from wow. Manchester to Montreal, I had a nine year extended Torah learning curriculum where I was able to catch up what I ordinarily didn't get because of uh, the education that I did receive. You know, I'll, I'll just pause you then. You now told us how you made it to Canada because uh, a lot of people turn to me for advice. And, and uh, just even last a few months ago, actually, somebody was wanting to kind of do what you wanted to do that, that, uh, kind of rapidly got into the field of Torah learning and a few years afterwards they said I want to learn for smicha and, and I kind of said to them don't <laughs> not because it's not a valuable thing to do but if you're interested in the title that's one thing but if you really want to learn Torah you really need to learn Torah and and they they needed to spend more spend more immersive time doing so and I think it's a really important lesson to to any person listening to this conversation, um, there is often <coughs> a desire to try and get to the end quite quickly. But as you say, uh, those three years learning the satellite <laughs> Lakewood Kalel uh, probably became, you know, really important in terms of you being 
plugging into the Masora of learning as well as finding your own voice within that Masora. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you, you then came, and is that that point that you are appointed as, as an assistant rabbi uh, in where you are now? Correct. Amazing. Wow. So that's that's an extraordinary journey. Gantz Hill Correct. to Lakewood. Uh, you know, to, you know I, I, have, I, have, I have to say, this is, we're still paused, right? <laughs> well, the, the recording isn't paused, but oh. the, the story is paused, you mean? Okay, the story is paused. Okay, sorry. I, I have to say that there is much to be said for both sides of the coin. Mm -hmm. Because, and I think we'll come to this later on in the interview, there is a great need for people in the Jewish world today to share their love of Judaism and Torah with others who know less. Yeah. And in the classic Chabad model that if you know Aleph and Bet, you should start teaching somebody else Aleph because you're already ahead of them by knowing Bet. That is true and that is needed and necessary. And the flip side of that coin is that you will only ever be able to teach them up to Bet because that's all that you know. And the more that a person has and the more built up a person is, the deeper the wellsprings that they can turn to and draw from. So it it's a double-edged sword because both are needed. Right. As you know, I, I'm somebody who is, uh, I take quite seriously the obligation of, of sharing what I know uh, and certainly believe that one has a duty uh, to share the learning one has. In fact, uh, I'll tell you two quick, quick insights. One, I remember, even though it happened like over 25 years ago, I remember I was, I was in a, uh, a shawl and Shabbos afternoon learning and a friend of mine he said uh, where does the Rambam tell us to learn Torah I, I said don't be silly I, it's in the Sefer Mitzvah so that's, that's an obvious one I can answer that he said go on show me and when you open the Rambam it says to learn Torah and to teach it there is no singular mitzvah to learn Torah coming with the mitzvah to learn is a duty to teach and so whatever one learns, there is a duty to teach. And if you recall, uh, in, in Parsha Ki Tavo, uh, where we're told about all the arurim, all the curses, arur shleroyakim et you know, curse be somebody who doesn't uphold the Torah, on which Yerushalmi says, that's somebody who has learned and fails to teach. And that frightens me. And so uh, I agree that one has an absolute duty to share what one knows, and I also agree that depending on what one knows depends on the kind of thing one shares and the kind of platforms one chooses to hold when sharing. But uh, that I'd love more and more people to be sharing to online. And, and until COVID, truth be told, social media was somewhat of a lonely world uh, for, for many people, uh, such as myself, who were sharing Torah, but thinking, where's, where's the rest of everybody else? Where's the other people who I know were sitting alongside me in Yeshiva, who may well even be uh, leaders in communities, but COVID has impacted mm -hmm. that and changed the way people look at technology. We're going to come to that in a second. So uh, a, a few more minutes just about that journey, and then we're going to get to our next question. So you yes. arrive um, after that nine-year journey, and you're hired as an assistant, rabbi in a in a pretty large community right yes i am blessed to arrive in montreal post smicha now and the community is a 700 family strong synagogue in the suburbs of montreal a beautiful community a wonderful community a varied community and my responsibilities as the assistant rabbi at the time were singular work with young families work with the youth of the community the senior rabbi who was the founder rabbi of the community who had been there at the time for almost 50 years if you can imagine had built up everything he had built the school he had built the Erev he had built the synagogue he had actually built the community there were no Jews living there at the time when he moved in so an exceptional builder, one of the classic 
models are Rabbi Riskin-esque 1960s, young 20-year-old from, from YU, building an empire, building a Jewish community. And like all Jewish communities, now we're 2010, dealing with a lack of affiliation, dealing with younger individuals who don't see synagogue membership as an important part of their priority, might not see Jewish education as a part of their priority. It's a traditional Jewish community, an inner core of Shomer Shabbos families with a much larger circumference of traditional Jews, um, the three-day-a-year type Jews, mm -hmm. as we can sometimes refer to them. And I came in, and to the credit of the synagogue, they gave me a blank slate. <laughs> I think it's partly because they didn't have any expectations or vision for what it was that they wanted as a method for a approaching and attracting the young families. But they gave me a blank slate. And I said, okay, great. So let us meet them where they are. But I share who shall. Mm -hmm. We are not going to achieve them coming to us. We have to go out to them. And I immediately asked myself in the 18 to 25 year cohort, what does an 18 to 25 year old want to do today? And in 2010, I don't know if it's still true, it might not be, it was travel and see the world. Mm -hmm. An 18-year-old who's lived at home with mom and dad, maybe somebody who's just entered the workforce, perhaps has their own apartment, starting to be independent, maybe financially has a little bit of money. What do they wish to do? They wish to travel. They wish to explore their independence radically. So I said, if we want the 18 to 25 year olds to come into the synagogue, we have to offer them an opportunity to go somewhere exotic. People were looking at me, scratching their heads. They said, no, Rabbi, you've misunderstood. We want them to come <laughs> into the synagogue. Right. Why are you taking them to Africa? I, the, you've missed the geography doesn't add up. So I created a Beit Midrash program where we would create the second thing that every idealistic young adult has, which is a sense of the universalism of Judaism's message. Judaism is both a universal Judaism and it's a particularistic Judaism. For a non-affiliated, non-religious, idealistic young adult, it's the universalism that becomes their particularism. And so we said, let us create a entire curriculum based on Judaism's uh, love of the stranger, righteousness, themes of charity, tzedakah, help and achrayut for the entirety of planet Earth. And with those themes, I created a study Beit Midrash program where we opened up a weekly learning for those who wanted to enter the program. We took a cohort of 30 young leaders and adults had to apply. I created an application process. I asked them for references. I, at the same time, created an entire study curriculum program while simultaneously creating a trip at the end of the year to put into practice what they had been learning in theory. We traveled to Africa for 10 days, visiting hospitals, orphanages, uh, institutions for children with HIV AIDS. We visited mud huts, looking at the worst poverty on the planet. And, um, it was eye-opening and devastating and powerful and an incredible experience. Don't ask me how we got kosher food. That, that's a whole other story, a beautiful story for another time. We then spent 10 days in Israel because it was important to mirror the particularism with that universalism. And we came home to our homeland, Israel, for 10 days. We were based in Beersheba, where the Montreal community is twinned through our local federation. And for 10 days in Beersheba, we renovated and restored bomb shelters in Beersheba. There were some bomb shelters that were derelict mm -hmm. and had been used by squatters, drug users, and those who fell through the cracks within the margins of society. And Beersheba, Iria, the city center of Beersheba had made the decision to lock the bomb shelters because they had become vandalized. And actually there were syringes, used syringes found on the floors and in the corners of these bomb shelters. Stop for a second. And think what that means. If a bomb was to be fired at Israel and everyone would run for safety, the city of Beersheba decided it was more dangerous to enter the bomb shelter than to be outside of it. They locked the bomb shelters. 
over those 10 days together with a twinned group of Israelis, similar age, we renovated three bomb shelters in Beersheba that were fully functional and tragically even used after we had, had left. I say tragically, obviously, but it was incredibly gratifying to be able to do that. That was one project bringing the 18 to 25 year old cohort into the show. And suddenly, you know, they're in the palm of your hand. What rabbi, you know, I click my fingers now, suddenly we've got three tables worth for our Simchas Torah din of young adults and a new cohort and a new wave of energy in the synagogue. And, and, and good begets good. The second side of that was the young families. Now I was a young family, <laughs> maybe I am still a young family, but I was definitely a young family 12 years ago. We came with just one daughter, Baruch Hashem, our two-year-old. Shalom bias is the most needed and necessary value in our world today. Mm -hmm. The family unit is disintegrating before our eyes for a whole host of reasons, which I won't go into right now, but sociologically, without giving you the fancy sociology, I'll just give you the bottom line. In the West, in North America today, the family is self-destructing. And so Shalom Bayit is the greatest need of the hour in every community across North America. But how do you get men into a shul to learn about Shalom Bayit? <laughs> you don't. Mm -hmm. Especially in a community where men are not coming to shul other than three days a year. And especially young families. So how do you square that circle? So I created a cooking class. I've never cooked a day in my life. Not because I'm a macho, chauvinistic man. It just it wasn't my background or upbringing. And Baruch Hashem, my wife loves cooking and... I created a cooking class where we were going to learn how to cook a five course meal, a starter, a main, a side dish, a salad, a dessert. And in those five classes, I said a men's only group. And for half the class, we're going to learn how to cook. I went out, I bought the fish, I bought the salads. I was schlepping. <laughs> it was schlepping. First class, they come in. It was about learning how to be a better husband. And for half of the class, I taught them how to cook. I didn't know what I was doing, but I taught them how to cook. You should have seen them. They were stood up around the outskirts of the synagogue kitchen, hands behind their back, looking at their feet, all asking the same question. Why am I being punished by being here? <laughs> Once said, this is self-electing, right? They chose to come, but they put, or maybe they were yeah, pushed. They chose to come, or maybe their wives pushed it. I, I made sure there was a few bottles of wine. We had to break the tension. And for the second half of the class, I would look at themes in Shalom Bayat. I, I put it into a modern language. It, with, with, there was no Sefer. There was no Hebrew text. Mm -hmm. If anything, it was a John Gottman book together with Rav Volbe's Kuntras Hachatanim. But you make it translatable into a language that's palatable. And half of the class was cooking. Half of the class was Shalom Bayat. And at the end of five weeks, they were better husbands. I gave them homework assignments. I, I, it was so beautiful. And... At the end of five weeks, they learned how to do a five-course meal. Week wow. six, I invited all of them to come a couple of hours early and their wives to come at dinner time. And the whole cohort <laughs> cooked and prepared the food that we had pr been practicing making now for their wives. Beautiful. And I ran that cohort after cohort after cohort. Suddenly, there was now 100 young families engaged in the show. Those were my first three years as the assistant. Wow. Now, it really sounds remarkable. And anybody listening who wants further details, I'll pass on your email address and maybe the menu. But I, I agree <laughs> with you. The shach and the taz on Isvaheta did not prepare me for that, by the right. way. Now, that, that I know. <laughs> but, um, but I think that, you know, Heschel has this uh, beautiful remark when he, he marched uh, alongside Martin Luther King that I was praying with my feet. Uh, sounds like what you did in Beersheba, which is a half an hour from my house, uh, you were praying with your hands, and, and the activities you're doing in the shul is very much, you know, it, it's a, it, it was a, an act of service, an act of service uh, of you to those men, and those men uh, in terms of investing in their relationship, and 
I think that is essential. And I think, by the way, that many ministers, uh, religious leaders, male and female, uh, should take a leaf from that book and think outside the box because when you know there's something which is a priority, in this case, it matters to do with the, the, with the securing and the protecting and the enriching the Jewish home, we can't simply say there's nothing we can do. You're saying, well, maybe there is. Uh, and at least let's try because not trying is itself uh, being defeatist. So, so thank you for sharing. Uh, and we've got a few more questions to get to. Uh, and so, you know, what? I'm actually going to uh, get to my second question, which I think is going to relate to what happened after year three, which I believe the minister had been there for over 50 years. He stepped aside, or retired, and, and you were appointed as, as rabbi of the community. Yes, the senior founder rabbi retired. He decided that he wanted to stay on in the community. Mm -hmm. And after building it from the ground up, he was at liberty to choose whatever he wanted to choose. Cool. I made the decision from day one when he informed me he wanted to stay, that I was going to honor him and support him wholeheartedly and entirely, come what may. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's a young rabbi watching this or a rabbi in the middle of their career that has an emeritus rabbi or somebody that they are working underneath, I have to tell you that it is the long game that is being played because after building up so many relationships and so deep a following, there were many people during my senior rabbi position that turned to him and said, I would like you to do our, our children's wedding. You know, mm -hmm. you named them. I want you, you know, yeah. I want you to, to bury my mother or my father because our connection to you. So there are moments in a life cycle event that a rabbi deepens and fosters and sometimes locks in a lifelong connection with the family because they are there for them at a heightened period of time. I forewent many of those opportunities because the community themselves naturally turned to the emeritus rabbi. Mm. And there are moments where you feel, am I spinning my wheels? I'm here, I'm trying to help. One of the greatest challenges as a rabbi is, am I actually making a difference? I can't quantify the difference I'm making in the lives of people. It's an invisible difference. And now in these moments, I'm being overlooked and missing out on an opportunity to forge a closer connection with these families. I made the decision that for the well-being and betterment of the entire community, what was best for the interests of the synagogue was to give our community their preference of who they wanted to choose and to use as a rabbi in their lives, in their moments of need and in their moments of celebration. Mm. And that has led to the most beautiful and wonderful of relationships between myself and the emeritus rabbi. It has led to a deepened commitment of perhaps some of the older cohorts of the community that I wouldn't have more naturally have gotten to know. And yet they feel today that their synagogue has been there for them consistently. And they see a very natural flow of transition as I continue now to build my deeper relationships with them. Uh, that's, that's beautiful. And I know not only from the community in which I went, I, I davened in, uh, Myrov became an emeritus rabbi, and, I, and I, I know he was incredibly gracious, and I know the, the rabbi that then took the community rabbi position was also gracious, but no matter how much goodwill, it can still be, create strains and, and, and frustrations, if you say that, and uh, certainly I also do coaching for rabbis, and people don't realize that those questions that you say, am I making a difference, are often asked by what others perceive to be the most successful of religious leaders. But uh, if you've worked to try and help families and, and all of a sudden it seems to be, and I, I want to stress seems to be, that that's not being valued. I know it is, but a person wants, uh, in perhaps uh, some days else involved, it, it can very much affect their self-esteem uh, and the confidence of, of a uh, of religious leader, a rabbi, and a rabbitson, for that matter. And I want to stress rabbitson because this is uh, a feeling that's <laughs> often been shared to me as well. And, oh, yeah. um, and, and it's important to at least talk about it 
uh, and I'm pleased you mentioned, and I appreciate your, your candor in doing so, uh, and the respect, obviously, not only you shared uh, to the Emeritus Rabbi, but obviously um, that that's been evident and visible to your community. Now, I, I want to uh, kind of somewhat uh, fast forward a little bit because being a religious leader in a community, especially in recent years, has been incredibly difficult. And I believe in, in Montreal, you've actually recently uh, gone through a lockdown uh, because of yeah. uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. And so can you tell me a little bit about life as a community rabbi pre-COVID and a little about the challenges that you and your community have had to face uh, during the pandemic? Life as a community rabbi pre-COVID meant many things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, meant many things. For the purposes of answering your question, I will focus in on being a community rabbi means being directly physically next to your congregants. And that means at a bris and baby naming, Simchat Bat, you're standing on the bimah with the family. At a bar mitzvah, you are standing next to the, the family. You are under the chuppah of the Khatan and Kala. You are, in some cases, if you really care, crawling into a hospital bed of those you love because your congregants are dying. And right now, the only thing you can do is hug them. And a great rabbi won't visit somebody in hospital. A great rabbi will crawl into the hospital bed with their congregants and hug them. And being a rabbi before COVID meant standing at a funeral, embracing a family as they bury their loved one. COVID created isolation in the extreme. There were no more hospital visits. Hospitals were closed to visitors. There were no more bar mitzvahs. They got canceled. Funerals had a limit to them of sometimes 10 people only. How many funerals did I do without the Kaddish? Because the family members, men and women, did not create a halachic minyan. Baby namings, brisses were now private affairs in homes. The physical embodiment of contact was, was gone. And that created an enormous challenge because physical presence is a silent form of communication that is the most powerful and profoundest form of communication. To stand next to somebody, not, not, not touching them, to stand in the presence of somebody is to communicate you're redeeming their solitude. Mm. And there is nothing more profoundly heard, nothing louder than to stand in silence next to another human being, letting them know you are not alone. Mm. And that was taken away during COVID. Now, Montreal, Quebec is special, as we like to say. Quebec took drastic measures, La Tovalera, I'm not going to judge or comment on them, but Quebec instituted a curfew and total lockdown. There's a complicated history of religion in Quebec. It dates back to the Catholic Church's position politically. Mm -hmm. Today, political parties are weary of religious institutions in Quebec and religious institutions were shut down first and the last to reopen. Wow. Unfairly so, movie theaters, shopping centers, restaurants were reopened, religious institutions were still not. We had a curfew at a time where we had to be in our homes under fine of a police fine before Shkia, we weren't able to daven Minchamar, we weren't able to daven Mariv in Shul. On, on, on Purim, the Megillah reading was able to be read in shul because already with the clock change, we had a curfew that did not allow for Minyan. Pesach Seder, we had a curfew. We had to be in our homes prior to Shkia, 
prior to sundown. So it has been very challenging in the extreme in terms of what it really means to be a rabbi and then to have physical contact, even leaving one's home. Mikvaot, tavila for women, going to a mikvah, there, there have been significant challenges. Wow. Wow. I mean, people know some of those issues. They may have experienced some of those, but when you put it together, it, it's, it's remarkable in, in not the most positive of the definition of that word. Um, yes. Uh, that we've lived through, uh, you know, a chapter such as that. And I don't think we've yet to see the scars that it's left on the, on the, on the souls of people, not just, of course, God forbid, the losses and the deaths uh, and, and the people who've been hospitalized. But as you said, the, the, the inability to gather together for really important things uh, and, and for many people at really important junctures in their life, uh, perhaps trips that they expected to be able to go on, such as, you know, you mentioned your trip to Israel, which was a game change in your life. And a lot of kids haven't been able to do that for the last couple of years. And we yes. wonder, well, what that may well be that there'll be less people who have the kind of uh, trajectory that perhaps uh, maybe not exactly the same as, but uh, reflecting the kind of choices you've made. So. It, it's extraordinary, and I just want to say I salute you. I salute you and, and all the, the men and women who work for communities, in communities, in whichever capacity. I know it's been brutal, and, uh, and of course, also the volunteers in communities. We often forget the volunteers. It's not just the people who receive a salary, but they too have had to adapt and pivot in so many different ways in thankless roles, um, and often ask themselves, have I made a difference? especially where lots of things haven't yet uh, materialized. But I salute you all. And uh... let, me, let me respond to that, because when you say I salute you, I have a visceral reaction um, that it's absolutely unnecessary to be saluted. And I'll share with you why. And I think I speak on behalf of every single rabbi. We become rabbis, community leaders, for one simple reason. And that is because we want to be with people and help them. And this internal drive is so profound, it animates everything that we do. Mm -hmm. During COVID, I have never worked harder. And during these last two years, I have never been busier. And it has never been more challenging. Mm -hmm. And I have never felt more personal fulfillment from my job experience than over these last two years. And many a rabbi, and I know I speak on behalf of myself, but others too, we simply felt that we were just doing our jobs. It was ordinary, it was normal. We, we were creative, we pivoted, we did a lot of online stuff, we became experts at Zoom. And yet, everything we did, we felt was ordinary, we felt was run of the mill. It was blessed with the concurrent, incredible benefit of feeling incredibly gratifying. And that's true. But to say it was amazing what you did, in the eyes of others, it may have been. To rabbis, it was actually, I don't think I'm doing anything all out of the ordinary other than simply doing my job, which is what I've always been doing. Now it just happens to be heightened and under a microscope. I, I, I take that on board that, you know, uh, by the way, my, my words of salute are unlimited to, to rabbis. I've written many, many expressions of gratitude and admiration for all those who work in the, in the health services. Absolutely. People doing their jobs well during tough times um, should know that they're not alone. You know, you speak about people who are, who are suffering, who benefit from the gift of self right from chesed that's how rabbi Sachs defines chesed the, the gift of self and um and knowing that others see what's being done like you said before sometimes people wonder have i made a difference so uh, I, I believe a lot of people have uh, and we all need chizuk we all need chizuk yes. and, and if, yes. if those words uh you know uh 
uh, to mean anything, it's to say it's good to give chizik, and uh, oftentimes people need it. So, right. I, what I want to talk specifically now about is, I mean, you are, you know, as you said before, you demonstrated through the kind of programming you did as an assistant rabbi and as a as a rabbi, especially in, in recent years, you think outside the box, you're, you're energetic, you're sensitive. Uh, and uh, I, I want to talk about two things. And I, let's start with the first. The first is the rapids. Now, for those who have yet to see what I mean, Google, uh, look on YouTube and find these wonderful videos that you created of, which is kind of a take on the Muppets. I believe yes. that this was there to, to engage, especially the younger members of your community. And there are you basically talking with some kind of, a, a, you know, a puppet about matters to do with uh, Judaism and faith uh, and um, <coughs> just all sorts of great things. So can you tell me a little bit about, uh, about, the rapids, how did it start and, um, and, and the way it's been received by your community? I have been shaped very deeply by the writings and works of Rabbi Sachs. And there was a line that he used among others on a number of occasions that seemed to crystallize and speak to me very personally. And that is, he was speaking of somebody else who said that, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the quote off by heart, this individual of faith took God so seriously that they didn't take themselves so seriously. Mm -hmm. and, and that speaks to me deeply. You can't take yourself so seriously. There's a lot of important things going on in the world. Your honor, your cupboard, your ego. Don't, don't worry. Don't worry. You're, you'll, you'll be okay. Don't take yourself so seriously. And with that introduction, um, again, my question is always, I've got content, again, I, the Torah has something profoundly important and urgent to say to every single one of us. I have an ability to translate its language and message into a popular street language of today. But people are not coming to a classic synagogue as much as I would like them to. Mm -hmm. The traditional tefillah, the traditional model of synagogue attendance is declining across North America, it's putting it mildly. If I have a message, if I have what to say, and people are not coming to me, then there's an obvious and simple solution to this. What, what immediately comes to mind is, of course, Elkanah visiting and traveling over the entirety of the land of Israel. It's impossible not to see that scream out from the text. You can be a Hophni and Pinchas. This is my office. You come to me. You want to see us. You know our address. Or you can be an Elkanah. An Elkanah. And that's exactly what you've been doing, Johnny, over these last few years. You don't need a wagon and a horse and buggy. <laughs> if in the disciples of the Baal Shem Tov were the model of Elkanah, literally, physically, geography today has collapsed via technology and I said to myself they're not coming to me I need to go to them mm -hmm. so how do you speak words of Torah to a child today so what does a child of today mean it doesn't just mean on the level of a seven-year-old or a nine-year-old or a five-year-old it means through the medium as well as the message and if you're a seven-year-old today you have an iPad in your hands. If you're a nine-year-old today, you have TikTok in your hands, maybe 11, 12-year-old. And so I decided that I would create taking puppets, you know, 50 bucks on Amazon. And I met the most wonderful, creative, talented individual. You meet so many people as a community rabbi. And this one individual, uh, you know, bar mitzvah of her son was how we met. What do you do? Who are you? Oh, I do voiceovers for television commercials and radio. Wow, that's not your typical answer. Amazing. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, oh, I've got a project in my mind. Would you mind being a voiceover for me? I'll give you a script. 
Ah, she's the voiceover. Ah, She's the voiceover. She's the voiceover. So taking a puppet, her husband was a good soul. He was underneath my table with his hand (laughs) up a puppet. So I've got this dynamic duo, husband-wife couple. He's the hand. She's the voice, all off camera. And I'm having a conversation with the puppet, calling it the Ruppets, because it's what you get when a rabbi meets the Ruppet, meets the Muppets. You get the Ruppets. So that's an example of how literally creative I am. I have no creators. I had to call it the Ruppets, unfortunately. <laughs> and M- Musa through nine-year-olds. Mm. Looking at the concept of Musa, patience, gratitude, satisfaction, appreciation, anger. I, 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 I don't know. I, just, I, I was reading a book on Musa, and I thought, oh, this is great. Let me teach it to six-year-olds. And we created a series of YouTube videos, no more than like two minutes long. Because again, the concentration of a nine-year-old who's watching TikTok, you have to speak their language. What that means is interacting with a puppet via YouTube. In those days, I was old fashioned. I was using YouTube. And, and for two minutes only, and that was the creation of the birth of the Ruppets. And fascinatingly, a lot of people older than nine years of age shared how much they appreciate it. I, I was a, I watched them I appreciated it uh, and you know you, you've touched on harnessing different platforms something which I strongly believe in um, and uh, there's a lot of discussion even today about is TikTok you mentioned TikTok an appropriate platform uh, I'll, I'll share with you two things both actually mentioned from Rabbi Sachs you know a mentor to us both firstly Rabbi Sachs in the Hill of Fractured World it quotes the Rambam which informed the Rambam basically tells us that Moshe Rabbeinu had power and with that he had to use it to try and kind of make the world a better place. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe said, well, I don't have power, but I could harness the power of influence, namely television. And if I have that at my disposal, I guess I should use it to try and share moral messages to the world. As we know, you know, he was trying to encourage the adoption and the observance of the Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noach uh, to the wider world and, of course, engage Jews as well. And that's something which he did, and Rabbi Sachs was a, a strong advocate and, and, uh, and uh, model of, of doing so. And you mentioned El Canaan, and of course, Chazal say something similar about Shmuel. So I'll tell you a, a, a piece of advice he gave to a good friend of mine. I won't mention the name in case <laughs> uh, he, he, um, he, may, he may not appreciate me, me doing so. But this friend in the early years of his rabbinate uh, wanted to meet up with young people where the young people were. And those were pubs. And so he wasn't sure whether it was really appropriate for uh, you know, a young rabbi to start going and schmoozing with uh, younger congregants uh, in local university pubs, not any kind of random uh, pubs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, he wasn't sure what to do. So he, so he called Rabbi Sachs and Rabbi Sachs wrote back, uh, quoting the Medrash about Shmuel. He says he was all over the country. Wherever the people were, that's where he was. If the people are there, that's where you should be. And I, and I believe that is an essential calling for every religious leader. And people are uh, in social media. And so that's where we also need to be in the synagogue, as you say, in the hospital. Um, I'll say one final thing, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I often find, especially in slightly more modern Orthodox communities, we overemphasize halakha, we underemphasize Musa. And I think it was great that you used the rapids, not just to teach how to do certain things, but how to be. Um, do you have anything to say just in terms of? the importance or, or, or the prioritization of, of Torah teachings on, on living, on, on Musa, on being as best a person one can be? Yeah, I have a lot to say. I'll try and be <laughs> concise. Okay. There's so much to say. I think this gets to the heart of my Judaism. Mm -hmm. and the Torah as I understand it. Um, In Ha'azinu, we speak of the Torah as katal imrefi, Mm -hmm. that my my teachings should drop as dew, Mm -hmm. D-E-W. And the Vilna Ga'on, 
on that pasuk says, you know, when it rains, everything grows. Beautiful flowers, but also weeds. And sometimes those weeds can choke out and kill the most beautiful of roses. I, I'm paraphrasing already. He says just the first in the classic Vilna a uh, uh, terse two words, mm -hmm. everything grows. But the Mepharshim on that gra explain that flowers grow with rain, but so too the weeds and unhealthy negative things grow. And the bracha that the Torah is giving us with, with Hashem's teachings dropping like tal is that there should be a gentleness to how they drop and a precise exactly in the right location because a person can learn Torah and become an achitofel. And the greater your Torah learning, the greater the damage you can create as a result of being empowered and emboldened and growing through your Torah. And the most important mistake people oftentimes make is that in proportion to the Torah that you learn, the better the person you become. And there is no connection whatsoever. And I know that there are different schools of thought on this. And I know that there are, the, the Torah is a mikvah and the Torah purifies and the Torah will. But in my experience, I have met the worst of people who are incredibly learned. And Torah is rain. But what are you watering? And what are you growing? And what are you feeding? And I don't think it's for nothing that Chazal associate David HaMelech's teacher as Achitofa. When he had a Shaila, he went to the Av Beit Din. That was the Rosh Sanhedrin. Mm. And, and Achitofa had the Torah didn't translate into who he was as a human being. And so I think Torah to me is a Torah chesed. It's a Torah where a person is an individual who can take the messages, lessons of the Torah and inculcate them. And to the greater degree that a person is able to see another human being and care for them, that is the expression of the degree to which they have been able to inculcate the Torah into their lives. Chazal point out that when a baby comes into this world, its fist is clenched. Mm -hmm. They're not making a biological statement there. And the bookend of that Chazal is that when a person leaves this world, their palm is open. They're not making a biological observation. They're making a moral statement. We enter this world selfish. Metaphorically, our hands are clenched into a fist. We're acquiring, we're grasping, we're taking. And in many ways, biologically, a baby needs to have that instinct in order to nurse, in order to breathe, in order to live. But the goal in life is not to leave this world as a child and as a selfish baby. The goal in life is to leave this world with our hands open as a palm. Our goal is to be able to be givers, to think of others, mm. and to share what we have with those who might need it. That is what the Torah is all about. It's, it's beautiful, and you know, it's really expressed in those words in Pasharei, Ki patoch tiftach et yadcha, you know, you should surely open your hand. Um, Mamesh. I, I want to talk about a different um, project, if you could call it that, um, that I recently saw a really exquisite uh, series of videos titled Becoming Big. And Becoming Big is the journey mm -hmm. of becoming bat mitzvah uh, and about a young woman called Maya in your community. Yes. And I was very touched by those videos. Can you tell me a little bit about Maya and, and really what you wanted to achieve with those series of videos titled Becoming Big? Thank you. Uh, Maya is an exceptional human being. 
and her mother is also an incredible person and they approached me because she was turning 12 she was going to have her bat mitzvah among many of the responsibilities i have is learning one-on-one -on -one with young adults in our community in preparation for their bar or bat mitzvah when maya's mother approached me she was extremely hesitant because maya was uh, an individual at birth who had been uh, born with physical challenges in the extreme. And so rare is her condition, it's a one in a million type condition, that it doesn't fit neatly into any one category. But it, it had a, a sense of challenge with sight, blindness, challenge with um, her growth, although it would not be described as uh, dwarfism, she has significant uh, physical growth challenges that make people feel that she looks like a six-year-old when she's actually a 12-year-old in high school. Um, there was a selective mutism. There were a variety of physical challenges. And, and as a result, social anxiety and, and, and mental challenges as well. The mother had approached me saying, can we give Maya a bat mitzvah? Now, if you know me, the answer is to any question, always, absolutely yes. Uh -huh. Let's aim for the ceiling. We're not looking at the floor. Let's be maximalist in every opportunity and every possibility. She said, well, what can we do? And I went through the typical ordinary approach that I would have with every single child that would come into my office. We're going to learn Torah. I'm going to give my uh, 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 written assignments. She will then produce content and we will create that into a presentation devar Torah. And we did not change the playing field. I did not change my expectation. She said, well, what will we learn? I said, well, I always learn something with the input of the child. What do they want to learn? Right. You remember uh, about Azara, Yetet, uh, Rabbi Yehuda, Anasi, Enadam, Ahmed, Al, Masha, Chafetz, Libo. You can only learn what you want to learn. So uh, put down Mishle, learn to heal him, was the example in the Gemara of Azara. What do you want to learn? What are you interested in? She had no clue. She did, she, she was, uh, I said, would you like me to make a suggestion? And here it's important not to tiptoe around an issue, but rather, People sometimes appreciate you diving directly into what could be an elephant in the room and to address where they might be thinking what their thoughts are. Mm -hmm. I said, would you like to learn about physical disability in the Torah? Would you like to look at how the greatest of our people had physical challenges? And she was like, people had physical challenges? And I said, well, they're not accentuated and it's not something that we typically focus on or even frame. But maybe with creative framing, we can take the Midrash of Avram Avinu davening for old age so that he and Yitzhak would be differentiated. Maybe we could look at what it means to age differently. Maybe we, look, we could look at our societies lusting after eternal youth, what it means to have a perfect body, what it means to have a perfect face what it means to be beautiful in 2022. Maybe we could look at Yitzhak Avinu with the Midrash of the Malachim's tears entering into his eyes on the Mizbeach. We could look at blindness. I know that blindness is something you're struggling with or your vision is something that is challenging. What does it mean to be blind? And perhaps through a different framing, we can look at Yitzhak Avinu's encounter with the Malach and limping away. What does it mean to use a wheelchair? What does it mean not to be able to walk properly? And maybe we can look at Moshe Rabbeinu and we can look at being covered pair as to have a stutter and speech impediment, a lisp, something that can reduce a person's self-confidence in their interactions in the world. And maybe we can realize that the Avot and Moshe Rabbeinu are individuals that all had physical challenges maybe even using the language disabilities and how did they overcome and how did they utilize and what was the interaction of specifically those challenges in making them who they were our whole face lit up and over the next number of months we studied exactly those topics and themes i realized almost immediately that she was a gifted child 
Her brain was incredible. So smart, so clever, always anticipating the next question before we had even finished it. And she was just ahead of the curve. And I realized that we had the makings now of a documentary. I asked the mother's permission. I asked Maya's permission. And I realized I got to get all of this on video. Because just like Avram, Yitzhak and Yaakov, Moshe Rabbeinu may have overcome their physical challenges. This was a content mirrors character type of expression where the medium became the message. We had to get it on video. And we created a documentary of her journey, learning with me, building up to the big day. I interviewed her teachers, her principals, her friends, her grandparents, had one-on-one -on -one interviews with Maya. And we put together a four-part series called Becoming Big. What does it mean to be a bat mitzvah? Typically, you become big. You become an adult. In the eyes of Jewish law, you're now an adult. You're a gadol. But that's physically. What does it mean spiritually, emotionally, intellectually to become big? And can a girl who is physically small teach all of us what it means to grow? It, it's so beautiful what you've said. And I'll just pick up on one thing. Just last night, I went to an event. Um, about stroke and aphasia. Uh, I wrote a post about it. For those who are interested, feel free to have a look. And the reason I did so is because what has now become a very dear friend of mine, uh, Eitan Ashman, uh, suffered a stroke and, and, and suffers from aphasia um, about uh, four and a half years ago. And that means that he struggles to say the words he wants to say. And I've been privileged to work with Eitan for the last couple of months as some kind of personal and spiritual coach. And basically uh, I did, and I've been doing something very similar to you. And you mentioned Moshe. I said, Eitan, you know, Moshe was lo ish manochi. A person can communicate in many ways, doesn't always need to be words. And, and it's impossible to describe how affirming that is to realize that a person who may be limited in some areas, still has so much to offer, so much to give, and that some of our great leaders may well have suffered from various limitations. It, it was a game changer in our conversations. And mm -hmm. to think we've been doing some similar work with Maya and those videos are just gorgeous. Um, it is, is beautiful. And I think these are ideas which really should be discussed more because they're there as you say they're there in the Torah in Chazal it's a question of framing but oftentimes it's all one needs a big heart and a hmm. desire to help somebody see things differently and um, it can really be incredibly empowering uh, and give a person the kind of confidence that perhaps until then they've lacked or a sense of belonging which until then they may have felt much more marginal for whatever reasons uh, in a community so uh, so that's beautiful and anybody who hasn't seen those videos uh, i can't remember if they're on youtube or they were on your facebook page but they are very much mm -hmm. worthwhile seeing and maya is is just a, as a gem of a person she's exceptional she's she, exceptional. very much is i want to i want to end by talking about something very heavy and something very recent, uh, because uh, you know you're somebody who you, you know you've through everything that we've been discussing. Um, you know you're somebody who's very sensitive. You have a great you know sense of humanity and, and a belief in in human dignity, and that was potently visible in a series of videos that you recorded last week because you weren't in Canada last week. You were in Poland, uh, in the Ukrainian-Poland border, where you went to assist uh, refugees, I think as part of a mission. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the journey of you getting there and you know, what you saw right now, the war in Ukraine is still raging. Uh, the, the casualties are, are frightening, um, but we hear big numbers. You saw people, individuals in the worstest moments um, in their life. So can you tell us just a little bit about that? And, and really, I suppose, both as a human being, as a Jew and as a rabbi, 
what you were able to bring uh, to those very difficult moments and very dark places. Thank you. I, like everybody else, was watching the television and news channels on the internet, wringing my hands, feeling powerless and awful. And to watch images of refugees fleeing their country on the soil of Europe within living memory of the Holocaust, when you watch that as a Jew, it takes on a very different perspective. And within a few days of that beginning, I felt that I needed to do something, even though quantifiably, I, I didn't think it was going to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. But I felt that I needed to do something. And so I reached out to two rabbinic colleagues of mine in Montreal, and I said, we need to go to the Ukrainian border and do something. There, there was no plan, there was no itinerary, there was no forethought in terms of logistically what would be effective. We just went. I have great colleagues here and friends, and within hours we had booked tickets, and a few days later we flew to Poland. Upon landing at Warsaw, we made our way to the border, and I want to I want to share a couple of things with you. Number one, it is so much worse than you can ever imagine. And what you see on the news does not capture even a little bit the reality on the ground. Because what you realize and see are thousands upon thousands of people walking through the streets, clutching a tiny backpack as their sole possession with fear in their eyes. What we witnessed was nothing less than a human sea of misery. We went to a train station, a large train station, three kilometers from the Ukrainian border. People are coming by train, people are coming by car, by bus load, people are coming by foot with the barest of possessions fleeing the country for their lives. And in this train station, a large train station, dirty, like a classic public train station. It was snowing. The floor was wet. People had put rags over the floor and people were sleeping in makeshift beds all over the floor. Wow. And we had gone to a supermarket to purchase coats and blankets and chocolates for the children and little toys. And we just started indiscriminately handing them out. And it was not coordinated and it was not thoughtful it was haphazard and it was indiscriminate and we just and then we were led into a room that had a big no entry sign and we opened the door and we realized that in that room hundred without exaggeration hundreds of young mothers with nursing infants and there is fear in their eyes and something struck me as incongruous and i wasn't able to articulate it and it was only after a while that i realized there's no men there are no men here. There are just women and children. And you realize that none of the men have been allowed out of the country. Everybody 18 to 60 is having to fight and they're not allowing men out. Most we would learn don't want to leave. They do want to fight. But the women, what can we give you? I, for the few people that I had told handed me envelopes of cash. We were indiscriminately handing petty cash. Mm. Take a coat, take a toy for the kids, take chocolate, take cash. What do you need? Tell me what you need. I want to go home. I don't need anything. I want to go home. And it was uh, through a translator. I don't speak Ukrainian. Through a translator. I, I don't know if my husband is alive. I don't know if my father is alive. I don't know if my brother is alive. Our community has been bombed. Our house has been bombed. We have no access to electricity. We are unable to plug in our cell phones. We can't recharge our iPads. We can't recharge our computers. I am unable to make contact with my family. Where is my father? Where is my husband? Where is my brother? I don't know where they are. I don't know if they're alive. 
I just want to go home. It's a sea of misery. Second thing that I was able to witness were the NGOs that were able to set up tents along with the border. As we got to the border of Ukraine, there was a row of police. They had blocked off streets with their lights flashing in their cars, what you would expect. We stopped our car. We got out. We walked by foot. Next, there was a roadblock. Now it was army, Polish army. We somehow managed to squeeze through them. And for the last thousand meters, as we walked to the physical border, there were tent after tent after tent of NGOs from around the world. Christians, Sikhs, Muslim, an amazing outpouring of human help with with hot food with clothes there were piles enormous piles of clothes polish people had just given their clothing simply because if you if it's the right size take it it's yours incredible generosity and as we got to the very border i'm 10 meters away from the border we weren't allowed to go beyond that there's one tent at the very front and at this tent at the very front in large bolded words rescuers without borders a singular israeli ngo set up a large tent with medicine flying proudly the flag of medina israel as these individuals primarily non-jews who are coming over the border by foot wheeling a backpack wheeling a small suitcase clutching a bag to their chest as their sole possession homeless helpless the first thing they saw was medina yisrael what does that say about our people what does that say about the jewish people what does that say about the state of israel said to the person the rosh sevet why are you here why are you doing this he said we're jews we are all agayim if not for this then why are we here who are we this is our mission statement this is who we are now, somebody challenged me from my community. It's, it's okay. There's, there's always one. Like, why, why did you go? What was the purpose? Yeah, you're a rabbi. You should, you should be here. And, uh, and, and he said, they're not even Jewish. Like, they have 43 million people in Ukraine. The Jewish community is 200,000. Do you realize that's less than half a percent? Who were you helping? I said to him, I, I didn't go because they were Jews. I went because we were Jews. We are Jews. That's why I went, not because they were Jews. And to realize that in the dark moments, and they're continuing and they're going on for the state of Israel and the Jewish people to make a difference is all the difference. I spoke at my child's school. They invited me after I returned to share some words. And I said to them, that in the third parak of the Rambam's Hilchot Teshuvah, Maimonides reminds us to see our lives as chetzia zachutz, chetzia avonot. We do beautiful things in our world and beautiful things in our lives, but we also do awful things in our lives. And we're both. We're made up of the best and we're made up of the worst. And the Rambam says a person should see themselves as if they are perfectly balanced 50-50. And who knows, mi yodea, to quote Mordechai, mi yodea, if the very next deed should tilt the balance and tip the scales for you and for your country and for your entire world. Quantitatively, it wasn't even an infinitesimal drop in the ocean. But qualitatively, we made one difference to one human being, perhaps even one child offering them a toy and a chocolate bar. And our Torah teaches us to see our deeds and the efforts that we make on a qualifiable basis mm. where we can make the ultimate difference at all, even if it should pale as a drop in the ocean. I'm blown away. I'm blown away. And I, I saw your videos and, and I heard you speaking from then. Anybody who didn't, I, I strongly recommend that they do, but I'm blown away by how you've described part of that mission, part of the Israeli mission, what you've seen, what's still going on, and reminded us, you know, it comes full circle. You spoke about 
uh, bringing young people to Be'er Sheva. And I said, it's like praying with your hands and, and, and you're doing that and then some. Uh, and as are all those other organizations and volunteers in, in, in what is a churban, a churban of a, of a country and, and of a people. And, and the chesed, the gift of self, you gave a gift of yourself by going there. And so do many other people. And we spoke before about Musa. You know, the, the, the person in the community may well say, halachically, you know, what, you know, what makes you go there? And you're saying, like we said before, about the blades of grass. It's about who we are. It's about who we are. It's about that drop of dew that you right. dripped on the lives of those who you met and those children who we wish them well. We've, yeah, spoken, we've spoken for a while and therefore, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap it up. But I just want to say thank you so much for this really great conversation. We've touched on so many things. <laughs> My uh, pleasure. And thank you for kind of bearing your soul and, and sharing so candidly about some of the issues that uh, you've seen, the people you've helped, uh, the journey you've been on, both uh, in terms of your uh, position as a rabbi and uh, the people in your community, as well as your most recent visit uh, to Poland, which is, it sent a chill down my spine when you were speaking. So um, I wish you well, Rabbi Mark. And, uh, thank you. And thank I'd, you. I'd like to thank you for hosting me and for bringing me on here. And my bracha to you is continue. Tamshich. Thank you. I only came into your orbit a few years ago through some of your posts. Since then, I have been fortunate to read your Daf Yomi commentaries, your beautiful Divrei Torah, and to follow your family's journey a little bit. There should be a continued refer Shalema to Donna, and to be able to continue bringing much light to so many, because as we spoke about, oftentimes we don't realize the impact we make. Mm -hmm. Many a beautiful story you have shared, many a Divrei Torah that you have written, I have been Kone Bashinui and Bashem Omra. Keep going. Tamshik. Bashem Lamar, as they say. An incredible light to our people. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank that. you. Take care.